It's September 22nd, 2023, and we're here on Lower Broadway, and I'm wondering what it would have been like to stand here in the year 1776 on the afternoon after one of the greatest fires ever to destroy New York City, the Great Conflagration of 1776. But before I tell you about the fire, be sure to check out my playlist called The Battle for New York on YouTube, which is a collection of all of my videos about the American Revolution as it came through New York City in the year 1776. So please check those out and you'll get a much better background on what I'm talking about here today. So as I mentioned, it's September 22nd, 1776. Lower Manhattan is occupied by British forces. General Washington's forces have retreated to the north. They're at the northern part of the island on Harlem Heights. Most of his soldiers are gone. A few have been stuck behind the lines. And all of the people we would call rebels or patriots or sons of liberty have also fled the city. So the city is full of British soldiers and people still loyal to the crown. People who have greeted the British are happy they're here and are happy because they believe the British are here to protect them from rebels who are destroying their stability, their prosperity, and their great way of life in the British Empire. And last night around midnight, just at the bottom of Whitehall Street, a fire started. A, an American prisoner out on a ship in the harbor said it looked like a candle had lit. And before he knew it, the flame of that candle had grown. By 2 a.m., the area from just a little bit above where we're standing, to all the way down at the bottom of Whitehall Street, near where the Francis Tavern is today, was completely consumed by fire. From here on Broadway to one block behind us at Broad Street. The, the wind blew the fire straight up north on this side of the Broadway. British ships surrounding the island have also seen the fire and they're going to make their way to see if they can assist in some way. But the fire doesn't stop here. By 4 a.m., it's covered twice this distance and is all the way up at Trinity Church. So let's head up to Trinity Church and see what's happening there. Now we're here at Broadway and Wall Street on the grounds of Trinity Church. By 4 a.m., the fire had spread this far, half a mile from where it started. The wind blew the fire across Broadway, just south of the church, so it now began burning up this side of Broadway. On the other side of Trinity Church, it completely destroyed the Lutheran Church and the Lutheran School behind the church. It will continue burning north. It will burn everything from Broadway to behind us where the Hudson River was. Trinity Church is completely destroyed in the fire. Behind us on the corner, the Sugar House also destroyed in the fire. But by now, the Loyalist firemen who live in the city have come out and are able to divert the fire just enough so that it bypasses the homes right here on Broadway. So it will continue to burn a little bit behind Broadway to the Hudson River and continue up to St. Paul's Chapel, another quarter of a mile away. Now, it's interesting that as this fire is burning through the town, people say that they see other fires starting simultaneously. We'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the video, but keep in mind that some of the people watching said, no, the fire didn't just move. It started in all these places at about the same time. So Trinity Church, 4 a.m., people are fleeing their homes in just their night clothes and running north to get away from the fire. So remember, here at Trinity Church, we're now a half a mile away from where the fire started. The fire started all the way down Broadway, where you can see that little clump of trees and a little bit past that. The homes on the left of the Broadway have all been destroyed for about a block to our left, and the fire is now burning up our side of Broadway. It's consumed the Lutheran Church, it has destroyed the original Trinity Church here on this spot, and is continuing to burn. Now, along this side of Broadway are some of the nicest homes in Colonial New York City. As a result, the fire department will come out and they'll protect most of those homes so that the fire will burn along behind Trinity Graveyard um, and the Hudson River protecting some people's homes. To give us an idea of the width of the area of the city that's being burned. The fire is burning toward us. This is Broadway. And as we look in this direction toward the Hudson River, and you see the trees over there in the distance marking the World Trade Center, that would be behind those trees. So this is the width of the area that's burning from up here on Broadway by the ice cream truck 
down there to the trees. So you can imagine the panic that is engulfing the city. It's the middle of the night. It's not yet dawn. Fire is raging up the Broadway, burning everything in sight, and people are just running as fast as they can, leaving behind their belongings, running north toward the town commons, which is City Hall Park, and where we're going to finish our tour today. So here we're at St. Paul's Chapel and the fire continued to burn until it got here. The firemen set up a break here and were able to use water from the Hudson River to douse the graveyard in water and also the roof of the building. That prevented it from catching fire from any embers that were flying on the wind. Many structures did catch fire that way with the embers that hit the, the roofs and then the buildings caught fire as a result. So St. Paul's Chapel, our oldest Georgian intact architecture in Manhattan, built 1766, was saved by the fire and we can still enjoy it today. But the fire wasn't ended. The fire continued to burn up around the graveyard and that would be behind us where the World Trade Center is today. So the fire continued burning to the north where it got to King's College and eventually stopped. In total, the fire burned three quarters of a mile and estimates are that I've seen on the low end 500 buildings and on the high end 1,000 buildings were burned. Even if we accept that low end 500 buildings, that is a lot of dwellings to be lost in one night. And the question still remains in 2023, who started that fire? And of course, both sides have an interest in blaming the other side. Let's take the British point of view first. They've come in, they've occupied the city, they're setting up their residences, putting their administration in place, um, granting refuge to loyalists who are coming in for their protection. It's unlikely the British would burn their own city. They, of course, will blame the Americans. The Americans have just evacuated it. And of course, it is kind of in Washington's uh, interest to not have a livable city for the English. And some of Washington's soldiers were still here in occupied New York. So the British immediately believed that Washington started the fire. Washington, on the other hand, was ordered by the Continental Congress to leave the city intact. He said he gave no orders and that he was not behind the fire. Now, eyewitnesses on the British ships and in the harbor, I mentioned earlier, said that they saw fires that started, it seemed to be simultaneously in different parts of the town. And this kind of lens some believability that there was some arson going on. They said they found batches of fire sticks, 18 inch long sticks used to start a fire as well as other incendiary devices hidden around the town. They also said they believed there were people involved in this. The British did execute some people um, that they said were uh, accused of the arson and there was just simply mayhem in the town. Now watching from Harlem Heights where Washington is, they're watching from the Morris Mansion, right? They're looking down over the town. They see this conflagration and one of Washington's officers said that someone did us a fine service this night by burning the town. So both sides blamed the other. Historians today believe that the fire started accidentally in a tavern down by Whitehall. It's what people believe today. But at the end of the war, when the British were leaving in 1783, the then commander, General Guy Carleton, convened what's called the Carleton Commission. And the Carleton Commission interviewed a whole bunch of eyewitnesses to the fire to see what they thought happened or what they saw, what they experienced. And it was interesting that people on both sides, people who would be rebels and people who would be loyal, all said they thought it was arson. So that's a really interesting thing. Now you can see why Guy Carleton wants to do this. As the British are leaving, they don't want to be held legally liable for the destruction of any houses that belong to rebels who left the town or patriots who left the town. So they're trying to legally absolve themselves of responsibility for the fire. And you can see the Americans would want to do that as well to not be held legally or financially responsible, thus saying the fire started at the tavern. But it was a tragedy travesty. All of those buildings were destroyed. Many people were injured, some people killed. Um, I mentioned people ran up here to the commons in order to find refuge from the fire. And now for the next seven years of British occupation, 
Where would people live who normally would live in all of those homes? Well, some of them will still live in those homes, covered by canvas in what will be called a canvas town. Through seven years of incredibly hot summers and unbelievably cold winters, colder than anything we have experienced in our lifetime, we'll live in those burned out canvas towns. Now, while the fire is burning through New York, the night of September 21st, morning of September 22nd, something else is going on, and that is the British have captured a young man. He's operating on the east side of the island, along the Long Island Sound. He's from Connecticut. His name is Nathan Hale. He's a captain in Thomas Knowlton's Rangers from Connecticut, and he has been caught spying. And we'll tell more of his story over on the Commons or City Hall Park. This is City Hall Park. That's our City Hall there. But at the time the fire burned in 1776, this was the town Commons. And I'm just stopping here for a moment to imagine what it might have been like just as dawn was breaking on September 22nd to see people spread out all over the commons with nothing but their bedclothes, whatever few belongings they were able to grab, just looking for their friends, looking for their family members, distraught, frightened, and wondering what would happen to them. So I'm just gonna take a moment here and think about the tragedy and the trauma the people of New York experienced that night. Now, over my shoulder, you see a statue, and that statue is here to commemorate Nathan Hale. And some of you might have heard about Nathan Hale in school. Nathan Hale was from a town in Connecticut called Coventry. He was a student at Yale, and an honor student, I should mention, at Yale. Nathan Hale was a great athlete. He held the long jump record. He was tall, he was strong, and he was of high honor and discipline. And when the Revolutionary War broke out, he enlisted in the Connecticut militia Thomas Knowlton's Rangers. And you might remember from my prior video on the Battle of Harlem Heights that Knowlton's Rangers were fighting in Harlem Heights. Well, not Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale had already volunteered to spy for General Washington. And as part of his mission, he was in civilian clothes, working his way here to New York City, where he said he was looking for a job as a teacher. He had his Yale diploma, he had his teaching certificate, he had some letters of recommendation, and was captured by the English. Now, I'm not gonna get into how Nathan Hale was captured, as there are many different stories of how it happened. They captured him, they searched him, and they determined he was an enemy soldier in civilian clothes, and therefore a spy. He was brought to the Commander-in-Chief, General Sir William Howe, at his headquarters, few miles to the north of us at 68th Street, the Beekman Mansion, General Howe declared him to be a spy and said, hang him tomorrow. Keep in mind that all of this is going on around the same time that the fire has been going on. So there's a lot of chaos going on in New York at that time. Well, Nathan Hale was kept overnight and the next day he was hanged by the Provost Marshal or Sheriff William Cunningham. Today we remember Nathan Hale's death um, by his last words, my one regret is that I have only one life to live for my country. And honestly, no one knows if he really said that or if it was made up later in order to give his death more significance than it had at the time. Nathan Hale was only 21 years old when he was hanged on September 22nd, 1776, a brave young American soldier. Now the British left his body hanging for three days next to a wooden cutout that said George Washington in order to humiliate the Americans. They then buried it in an unmarked grave. Nathan Hale's body to this day has never been recovered. So here in City Hall Park, we have the statue honoring Nathan Hale. So thank you very much for joining me in this commemoration of the horrible conflagration of 1776. Please share and like my videos and subscribe to my channel because there's a lot more coming about the battle for New York in 1776. And by the way, before I forget, if you're in New York or you're coming to New York, please take a tour with me. I love to meet all of you and to have you in person on my tours. Until next time, I'm Mrs. Q. PatriotToursNYC.com.